Good, uh, hello and good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our friends at El Rio for hosting today's session on evaluation and treatment of seizures in children and adolescents with Dr. Hayward. Dr. Jean Hayward is a retired child neurologist after 31 years of community hospital-based practice, including resident and medical student teaching. She led the child neurology department, bringing the number of child neurologists from two to 14 during her time as chief. Dr. Hayward particu particularly enjoys teaching families and providers. During her practice, she was awarded the Karis Award for demonstrating compassion for her patients and teaching this to the providers with whom she worked. And we are honored to have her as a Maven Project volunteer. Dr. Hayward, when you are ready, please begin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much for having the interest in uh, uh, children and their seizures. Uh, those of you who take care of children uh, and adolescents know that they have seizures. If you take care of them and haven't seen a child with seizures or a seizure yet, they're coming. Um, about half of kids will have a seizure at some point in their lifetime. Uh, so when you have children with seizures, it's often there are often lots of questions coming from their very concerned parents and the kids themselves as to whether this is epilepsy, what medications should they take, when they, are they going to stop them, will they always have epilepsy, and we'll address those um, questions in my talk today. Please feel free to enter those questions into the chat box and then um, we'll answer them at the end. Uh, I have nothing to disclose at all. So the first question you might have is, what is a seizure? A seizure is an abnormal neuronal discharge from the cerebral cortex. You can't see that, of course, because you're just hearing a story about what happened to a child. But the history is what leads you down the seizure pathway. Um, this, these spells are usually intermittent, so they're often self-limited. And they can be clinical, where you actually see something happen. They can be subtle, where there's a suspicion that something's going on, or they can even be subclinical, where you don't see anything specific when you're um, interacting with the patient. These are categorized as being acute symptomatic if they're um, provoked. So say someone hits you up the side of the head with a bat um, and you have a seizure immediately thereafter, that would be a, an example of a common post-traumatic seizure. Um, or a child who had, for instance, a systemic illness like meningitis. Um, and so those are, a, acute symptomatic seizures um, that are provoked by some event. And those are not typically considered epileptic uh, at the time, although they can sometimes lead to epilepsy if there's been brain injury that is permanent. An unprovoked seizure occurs without a clear provoking event. So out of the blue, you're watching TV and suddenly the child has a seizure um, uh, or in school or playing outside or whatever it is. And so epilepsy is defined as the state of recurring disposition to recurrent seizures that are considered epileptic. Um, and these are typically not provoked. Although again, in young children, there can be instances that provoke the seizure such as fever. Um, epilepsy, as I said, is quite common. Uh, in children, there is anywhere from 0.5 to 8 per thousand person years. Um, and up to 1% of children will have a single afebrile seizure by the time they're teenagers. Three to 5% of kids will have one febrile seizure. So these are really common seizures in the young, younger group, the toddler group, um, age six months to six years. Um, and so again, you'll see these commonly in the family will be you know, quite concerned and wonder, does their child have epilepsy if they've had a single febrile seizure? And the answer is no. 30% um, of children who have febrile seizures will have more than one febrile seizure. And, but only three to 6% of children who have had febrile seizures go on to develop epilepsy. So it's a relatively small amount of that um, three to 5% group of kids with febrile seizures. There are types of epilepsy and there have been numerous uh, classification schema over the years, some of which are incredibly complicated. They look like a, uh, I don't know, a, a, a map of a subway system that goes everywhere and others are, are quite simple. Um, I, I like to keep things simple. Uh, and so I have uh, um, the, the group that I, or the, the pathway I've chosen is uh, seizure type. Uh, so is it a focal seizure or a generalized seizure? Um, is there impaired consciousness or in, not impaired consciousness? And then you can add in more information as you get it. So there are motor events, sensor events, autonomic events, like, you know, change in pupils or blood pressure or perfusion uh, with flushing or pallor, that kind of thing. 
And then does the seizure that started with focality, does it progress to a generalized tonic-clonic seizure or does it stay uh, more focal and stop on its own? And then there are generalized seizures. Um, and these often originate deep in the brain and have uh, a rapid spread to involve bilateral brain networks and typically have bilateral expression on the patient. And most have loss of consciousness, but not all. And then there are sometimes there are unknown known types of seizures. So for instance, infantile spasms, which is a rare but important type of infant seizure, it's not entirely known where these seizures emanate in the brain. However, um, they are thought to emanate deep from the brain and then spread rapidly, often to involve both hemispheres. And then there are some seizure types that are unclassified, which is, is rare. Um, if you look at epilepsy syndromes, this will sometimes help you to think more about your patient. So if you have a, a, a seizure type, as we talked about before, then you can also have syndromes, which are more description of the age of the patient and the uh, circumstance, uh, associated conditions. Um, and this often helps you lead you to treatment and to know what the course will be. So there are neonatal seizures. These can be benign and self-limited. There are actually familial benign newborn seizures. So if you have a family history of a child who in the newborn period had seizures and has grown up and is well, and then the next child comes along and has newborn seizures, you will still evaluate them in the same fashion. However, you might be more reassuring to the family than with the first kid. And of course, if you're lucky, the family, the mom or the dad had newborn seizures and um, you know, tells you that information and in, in, the, in the newborn nursery, and you can, again, still evaluate the child thoroughly, but again, you might be uh, more reassured. And there are now uh, genetic tests that can be done to confirm those uh, familial benign uh, newborn seizures. Uh, there are also more malignant seizures that occur in the newborn period, and that includes myoclonic epilepsy or and Otohara syndrome, which are, again, are very rare kind of um, seizure syndromes, but are uh, dreadful in that they, they lead to ongoing seizures and disability in these children typically. And many of those are now becoming associated with um, genetic, you know, gene abnormalities on genetic testing. And so these kids will often have had uh, thorough evaluations in the newborn nursery with uh, genetic panels, which in, in neurology are becoming the answer for everything, it seems. Um, again, if we continue along to the inf infant down to up to the two-year-old, febrile seizures become incredibly common. Um, there are other uh, seizure types as well. They're listed here that are all relatively uh, rare. West syndrome, which is the syndrome of infantile spasms, which occurs typically around six months of age, um, is important to recognize because it has its own treatment pathway um, and uh, specialized medications that uh, are prescribed. And so these are, are kids that are important to recognize. And they're typically children who have, uh, they're six months old, so they haven't actually you know, had a whole lot of development yet. And they've often have a benign uh, newborn course, but then they develop um, sudden either flexor spasms where they jerk forward suddenly, almost looking like they have abdominal pain um, or extensor spasms where they sudden stiffen and straighten. Um, and these are fleeting seizures that last seconds. Um, and these kids need immediate referral for EEG and uh, specialty neurology consultation. There are lots of funny things, as we all know, that children do. And so, um, it, you know, it seems, depending on the uh, sensitivity of the parents to the parent websites, that there are a lot of families who know now about Web uh, West syndrome and are concerned that their child has this. And we certainly see a fair number of referrals for kids who, you know, have colic or whatever they have, don't really have West syndrome, but the parents are specifically concerned about that, have asked about that, and those kids get an immediate referral for an EEG and neurology consultation. But fortunately, um, many of them don't have West syndrome. An EEG with sleep uh, is required to uh, eliminate that possibility or that diagnosis, and it has to be... Um, you know, done as soon as you are concerned about that diagnosis, but if it's after one event, you may have to repeat the EEG in two weeks. 
And then as you continue into childhood, um, there are a whole slew, as you can see here, um, of seizure types that occur in childhood and you know, in elementary school age kids. Uh, the most common types are uh, absence epilepsy, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and then uh, Bex or Rolandic epilepsy, as it used to be called. Uh, the rest of these epilepsy types are uh, really pretty rare, relatively. Uh, as a child neurologist, they keep you busy every single day of the week. Um, but the ones that are common that you'll see in your clinic and um, probably be managing are, would be the childhood absence epilepsy and the benign epilepsy with central temporal spike specs epilepsy, which is also called Rolandic epilepsy. And then as you get into teenagehood um, up to adulthood, um, the epilepsy types you can see are sort of tailing off. Uh, there's less that are developing or coming up de novo in this age group. The most common type is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, JME. And these are our kids who have um, early morning body jerks, um, generalized seizures, and they can ha have uh, staring spells as well. Uh, it's an important diagnosis to make because these are driving age kids. So they're, you know, it's around the time that they're getting the driver's license, at least in California, you can drive at 15 and a half with a Per person next to you and 16 on your own. And so it's Im important to figure this out before the child is, or the teen, I guess, is, is driving a car independently because obviously a seizure in the middle of driving could be a uh, problem for all involved. So when you're presented with a fa family and a child who has comes in with a concern of, um, was this event that they witnessed or they heard about, they may not even have witnessed it, a seizure, the first thing to do is try and get as much history as you can. And that's um, often lacking, especially if it happened at school, um, assuming kids are going to school, but anyways. Um, uh, and you know, if it happened elsewhere and the parent who's bringing the child in didn't actually witness anything, just got a secondhand history, you're sort of you know, gonna be getting third-hand information. But in any case, you try and get as much information as you can. It's very important to ask were the eyes open or closed time of day this occurred? Was the child awake or asleep? And was there anything that provoked it? You know, was there trauma? Was there a drug ingestion, alcohol ingestion, that sort of stuff? Um, maybe the child's already been to the emergency room, in which case getting the ER records is handy because you can see what labs were done and what history they got. And especially since that was probably closer to the event if, you know, they were taken immediately to the emergency room. Um, in theory, everybody who walks through the ER gets a talk screen, I think. Uh, probably now they get a COVID test as well. Um, but in any case, uh, looking at for these lab results will, will be helpful. Um, there's certainly plenty of teenagers whose parents swear that they are on the straight and narrow and their talk screen shows marijuana or alcohol or whatever, um, those being the two most common substances, both of which can provoke seizures. Family history is also really, really important. Um, if stepmoms bring in the kids in, you may need to, you know, get on the horn to dad and biologic mom to get more family history. As 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 the you know a second parent or second marriage parent may not actually have all the family history. Um, if somebody has a cell phone video of the event, which it happens pretty frequently, it turns out, um, it's great to get a review, have you review that, and um, you know, see what that what that shows you and tells you. It's often quite revealing. And then looking into the past, at what's happened in the past? Is this, did this child have febrile seizures when they were younger? Is there a family history of a sibling with febrile seizures? Um, did, was there a year ago a funny event that people kind of blew off because they didn't know what it was and it sort of didn't recur? Um, is there prior neurologic disease? Does a child have cerebral palsy, developmental disabilities, uh, learning delays, that sort of stuff? These are all very important because they, needless to say, are, are more common uh, in children who then develop epilepsy. I love putting pictures in my slide in my slide groups just to mostly keep you guys awake, but to keep me entertained. Uh, this is Colorado, and this is a beautiful lightning strike on a hill that was fortunately far away from my son who was taking the picture. Uh, once you've got the patient with you, and you know you've decided this could have been a seizure, uh, you might be thinking of doing tests. Um, and the two tests that we think about commonly for children with, with seizures are EEGs and MRIs. We try not to do CT scans as much um, because of the radiation involved, although in the ER that may have already occurred. Um, CT scans are pretty good, uh, generally pretty good uh, pictures these days. And so I guess if a kid, child has a CT scan done and it was interpreted as normal, I would probably go ahead and get the EEG first 
and then decide whether an MRI is indicated. If, for instance, the EEG is, is focal, you know, there's a left frontal discharge, I would follow that with an MRI with that specific information, you know, asking, do you see anything in the left frontal area? Um, so, and, and again, part of this is cost driven. Uh, sedation for the smaller child, you know, for an MRI is required. They have to sit still for about 40 minutes. So it's all, you know, you have to decide what you're going to do. Um, EEGs do not require sedation and should no, never require sedation. Um, the best is to get a sleep to five EEG if you can. And it's important to explain this to the family so they can participate in that um, test. Uh, sleep deprived EEGs allow the child to become drowsy and get into early, if not um, mid range sleep, you know, stage, stage one and stage two sleep, as it used to be called. Um, and that's an, an important sleep to try and uh, record because that sleep uh, is a time when the brain is more likely to give off abnormal discharges. So if you're going to catch an abnormality mm -hmm. during sleep and wake is your best way to get the EEG. Um, the reason the family has to participate in this is that they have to do the sleep deprivation. And so that typically involves keeping the child up at least two hours later than their usual bedtime and getting them up at around two hours prior to their usual bedtime, which means that the family is going to bed late and getting up early as well, and everyone's cranky and tired. Um, but it's important for the family to understand why they need to do that in order that for them to be compliant and you know, give it their best shot. Um, if it's an infant, it's often, you know, the EEG again is, is helped out if they can not only do some sleep deprivation, but um, try and schedule the EEG time for when the child is actually supposed to be napping. So sleep deprived, keep them awake in the car seat on the way to the EEG lab, and then um, nap time scheduling, and you're going to get most of the time you're going to get a sleep EEG. So it's, it's worth the family's effort. Um, it's, this is just mandating rep mandated reporting. I, I'm sorry I didn't look it up for uh, uh, Arizona, uh, but you can look it up, I'm sure, online. So there, if you have a, a loss of consciousness, not, not just a seizure or diagnosed seizure or epilepsy or whatever, but loss of consciousness, you're typically required to report this either to the Department of Public Health or to the DMV. Um, in California, there's a public health reporting form. You have to fax it to the county where the patient lives, to the DMV office, and then put a, put a copy of that notification in the electronic medical record. Um, and then how you resolve the driving uh, license restriction is also depends on, on where you, know, you live. In California, we're, you know, we're kind of the land of the loosey-goosey. So it's a reasonable length of time, <laughs> seizure-free, which of course the average teenager is tomorrow. Um, and whereas in other places, it's actually stated as a number like in North Carolina, it's six months. Um, and so in, I think Pennsylvania, it used to be a year. So it's important to um, know this information because when you are reporting a teenager for a seizure, I, I always tell them you're reported to the DMV. If you have a driver's license, you should go ahead and surrender it, call them and tell them you can't drive. You get your, your car insurance money back too. Um, and then to hold out hope that they're going to get their license back at some point, um, you know, at whatever the duration is that your state requires. So we'll talk a little bit about seizures that show up based on um, ages. So I talked a little bit about infant, infantile spasms. These are these funny body jerk seizures that occur in infants between two and 12 months of age, although they can be in younger infants or older infants, and the average is six months. Um, and they can either be flexor extensor or, you know, one side flex and the other side extended, so they can be asymmetric. Um, they typically occur upon awakening, so the child has been sleeping nicely, and then they awaken, and often within minutes of awakening, they have um, these spasm uh, seizures, and they often occur several in a row, like five, ten in a row. The child otherwise seems fine, looks well, doesn't necessarily have loss of consciousness that you can tell, um, and uh, will often cry out or seem irritable with each uh, spasm and then it seems fine afterwards, isn't necessarily sleepy. Um, kids under five years of age, so six months to six years, temperature greater than 101.5, uh, can have febrile seizures. So um, it's important if you can to get the family to tell you what the kid's temperature was. 
Um, sometimes that's not available. And um, sometimes the child's been dragged by the local EMTs to the local emergency room, stripped down in their, you know, underwear or diaper and arrive hypothermic. And you, so you may not actually have evidence of a fever. Um, the seizures are often generalized and we don't usually treat these with daily medication. The, um, for kids with febrile seizures, I, we do recommend that the family um, take the child's temperature. We do recommend that they give Tylenol or ibuprofen if the child is ill, but it's important to also remind the family that extensive research over decades now has shown that in children who are prone to febrile seizures, that giving Tylenol, uh, although uh, acetaminophen, uh, although it's not been shown for ibuprofen, but probably the same story, giving acetaminophen uh, with illness does not prevent febrile seizures. And, and we don't help these poor families out because you know the first thing you say is, did you give Tylenol? Did you take the temperature? You know, like somehow they could control all this. And the answer is unfortunately, typically what happens is the child is becoming ill, is not visibly ill yet, and the temperature is shooting upwards. And as the temperature shoots upwards and starts to peak, the seizure occurs and then now the child's febrile. So they weren't febrile, febrile five minutes ago and now they are and now they're having a seizure. Um, we do recommend rescue medicines if children have had multiple febrile seizures, um, and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, between the ages of four and 10, absence or petit mal epilepsy is uh, relatively common. Um, these are kids who will stop, stare, eyes open, blank out, not take information in, so not respond. And these are typically lasting less than 20 seconds. If the children are walking, they'll keep walking. Um, if they are swimming, they'll keep swimming, thank goodness, um, although I wouldn't rely on that personally. Um, and they will, you know, sort of turn back on, you know, their seizures now over and they jump right back into whatever it was they were doing. This is pretty common. It's 12% of all childhood onset epilepsy. So you will see these kids. Um, so that, that's an important um, diagnosis to make. They often are doing fine at school. Uh, they're not typically having learning problems, although there's a slightly higher chance of reading difficulty in this age group, kids with absence epilepsy, but nonetheless, um, they're otherwise kind of normal kids. But kids over from three on up um, can have partial onset seizures. So uh, seizures that are may have focality um, and can have loss of awareness. They may have autom automatisms like chewing or blinking or picking uh, with their fingers and they may or may not fall over or have a secondary generalized seizure with tonoclonic movements. We talked a little bit about the JME kids, the kids with juvenile monoclonic epilepsy over age 11. These are puberty onset seizures. So if you look at when puberty happens, girls, it's around 11, it seems these days, boys, you know, 14 to 15. Um, and again, these are the kids that have these early morning body jerks. Uh, if they're holding a glass of orange juice, for instance, if, and they jerk, they might spill the juice. Um, the jerks often occur or, or right after getting up, so the kids don't necessarily um, have a parent in their face at this, that time. You know, they're brushing their teeth, they're getting dressed, they're getting in the shower or whatever. Um, they can have generalized seizures as well, and they can have um, uh, falling seizures uh, and sometimes staring spells. So these are there's a constellation of, of seizures, and some of the kids will, will, will be picked up with just the early morning body jerks and never have a grand mal seizure before they're diagnosed. Um, and that's kind of nice, I guess, for those kids because they don't have to suffer with a grand mal seizure and all the consequences thereof. Um, the remission rate, so how many kids lose this epilepsy or outgrow it, is not very high. It's 20%. So 80% of kids with JME keep JME into adulthood. It's an autosomal dominant uh, epilepsy, so it runs strongly in families, although it does have incomplete penetrance. Um, and so it is really important diagnosis to make because now you're going to be working with these pre-driving early teenage kids on the concept of, you know, you're going to have epilepsy for a long time and let's kind of deal with that. So it's a, it's a big diagnosis for the child and for the family. Um, at age nine, you sometimes will have kids with the late onset petty malls. This is often called atypical petty mall, and they are, have a higher chance of having grand mal seizures in addition to their um, stopping and staring spells. And they're, they're treated differently if they have grand mal seizures, as we'll get into at the end here. So you've decided the patient could have had a seizure. You've got the tests running. Um, they've already been to the ER. Nothing exciting was found. 
it's important to talk about seizure first aid with this, the family and the child. They're going to take this child home and, you know, worry, I'm sure. Um, so it's important to remind them briefly of, of how the family can help the child if a, if, if a grandma seizure happens um, again and uh, now they're, you know, aware of what it is. So if the patient's having grand mal seizure, we want them rolled on their side. There's a rescue position, which is where you're on your side, your lower arm is extended above your head and your head is resting on it. And then your um, lower leg, your, your down leg is extended and the upper knee is flexed. So you're sort of tipped forward on that knee. And that will often keep a person after the seizure is over, and but they're not responsive, that will keep them in a nice sideline position so that if they vomit, which is very common in children with seizures, they won't aspirate. We do remind people not to put anything in the, in the child's mouth. There's an ongoing old wives tale that they're gonna swallow their tongue, but uh, it won't happen because your tongue is attached to your entire jaw. Um, so it's important to remind them not to put anything in the child's mouth, even if there's spit and blood and you know, funny breathing and whatever is going on. I do explain that families can do a jaw thrust um, with the thumbs behind the angle of the jaw to pull the jaw forward a little bit to help their airway. Um, but I do really remind them strongly not to put anything in the child's mouth. I try to get people to look at the time of onset if they noted when they notice the seizure or notice the postictal state and the child's condition. Have they vomited? Are they blue? Are they gray? Et cetera. If they're calling for help, um, which we don't discourage people from doing, if they feel that they need to call 911 for help, then they should do that. Um, I do remind them, however, to open the front door. Um, if you call 911, at least in California, and you don't open your front door, they will break it down and now you have to replace your front door. Um, for seizures that last longer than five minutes, which is rare, uh, most seizures are la last just a couple minutes or less, but it seems like forever. But nonetheless, if the seizure actually lasts five minutes, then we do recommend that they administer rescue medications. And this comes in the form of diazepam, which is a rectal gel, or midazolam, which is a nasal spray. Um, for kids who are out and about in the real world, you know, and this is mostly middle school and high school kids, because theoretically elementary school kids aren't out and about by themselves. Uh, we do recommend metal alert bracelets, which almost nobody in 31 years ever wore. <laughs> or now that everyone has a cell phone, uh, the cell phone phone information uh, can be quite useful. And so everybody's cell phone, both the, um, uh, the iPhones and the whatever the Samsung ones are, um, they have a medical information tab and you can set it up so that it has both your condition, your medication, your emergency contacts, which have been pulled in from your contacts. Um, and it, can, it will be uh, accessible by anyone who picks up your phone, even if the face of the phone is locked. In the, on the iPhone in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a thing that says emergency. And so if you pick up your phone and you, you didn't open it with the right thumbprint or the right face or whatever. If you hit the emergency word, then the next thing that comes up is a red medical ID. And if you filled it in, it'll, it'll give you all that information, including uh, who to call and what medications you're on and this and that. Um, so that's important to set up. And I, with all my teenagers and, and middle school kids who have cell phones, which most do, um, and if they don't, I actually encourage the family that this would be a reason to consider a cell phone for that child. Um, I give them the, either we set it up in the office together or I give them that as homework. And then when I see them back, the first thing I do is say, show me your phone, show me your medical information um, and, you know, pull it up for me. Um, so I try very hard to get the child to fill that out. And then of course I say to the family, so and you guys, you know, ever use this for yourselves? It's probably a good idea. Everyone should probably have this. Um, for uh, Sleeping conditions, um, a lot of times the family will end up sleeping in the room with the child or in the bed with the child, which leads to no sleep for anybody. But anyways, um, we do recommend that the bed is pulled away from the wall about three feet. The child should not be in the top bunk, obviously. The reason to pull the wall, the bed away from the wall is that if you have a grand mal seizure while you're sleeping, you move enough, you can actually wedge yourself between the bed and the wall, even if the bed is up against the wall and heavy and can't move and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's certainly many people who have suffocated in, in this um, instance. And so it is important to make sure that the family rearrange things. If the child is near or in water, they need constant supervision, period. 
um, swim team is perfect for this because the coach is watching you, you know, you're going up and down, you're swimming your laps, they're checking your style. Um, and so to, having seizures does not preclude swim team. It just means that you have to um, have someone watching you and the coach of course should be apprised of the medical situation. For patients who are going boating or out on a lake or a river or whatever, and even just near a river or a lake, um, I always recommend life jackets. Life jackets uh, float you and they have a handle on the back. So if you have a seizure and you fall into the river or off the boat with the life jacket on, you float and the handle allows someone to help rescue you when you're unresponsive. Um, this unfortunately has happened to several of my patients over the years and fortunately they all survived. So um, it's really, really important to emphasize this. And, you know, you may think, oh, well, this family doesn't ever go boating or whatever. It's just amazing how stuff like this comes up. There's a school trip or a school swim team or whatever it is. And so it's important to really be clear that water is um, fatal for people with, with epilepsy if you have a seizure in the water. And then you're going to notify the school and the daycare because that's where the child is all day um, and any of their caretakers, of course. So let's talk medications a little bit, because then at the end, we'll talk about how to get rid of them. Um, for febrile seizures, uh, again, I mentioned previously the criteria for six months to six-year-olds with fevers greater than 101.5. And we treat the fever as best we can. Uh, we prevent the, vac the febrile illness with vaccination. So that's really, really important, especially in these days of anti-vax people who don't give vaccinations. Uh, to speak specifically about the one-year-olds getting MMR varicella combo shots, we split those apart. So if a child has had a febrile seizure prior to a year of age, they're, they're actually very likely to have more febrile seizures because uh, that's a very young onset for febrile seizures. And so we recommend that they have the MMR and the varicella given separately, and they're available separately, give them separately a month apart. Um, and that's been well documented to decrease the height of the fever and therefore decrease the number of febrile seizures. Um, and so I've got that in my next line. And then there is a medication diaz diazepam rectal, which is called diastat commercially. Um, and this is a syringe that comes with a pre-measured dose, which is uh, based on the child's weight that can be prescribed for the family or the school or the preschool um, to have available if a seizure were to start up. Um, in California, the schools won't give it unless there's an RN available to give it, which, you know, is kind of irritating because uh, at home, of course, there's not an RN at home when the parents just give it. Um, but I do recommend that if the school will give it, that they should have that in the office. Um, private preschools are more likely to you know, be compliant. Uh, public preschools, not as much. But I do recommend that if the, if the school will keep it at the school, then the parents, if they rush to the school because of a seizure and get there before any 911 people do, which can happen, that they'll have the dose available for them. And so we try and sprinkle um, packages of this medication throughout the child's you know, existence, basically. So some at home, some at school, some at grandma's, at the babysitters, or wherever um, <coughs> the child spends time, uh, this should go with them, or it should go with the child in their backpack if they're young enough that the backpack of the diapers and you know, the snacks and whatever else goes with the child from point to point. Um, it's, it's quite effective medication. It's not associated with respiratory suppression. It's given rectally, um, which makes everybody squirm, but it's just a nicely available orifice, orifice with good absorption. I said earlier that infantile spasms are quite rare, but it is an important diagnosis to make because um, of the uh, hope that early treatment leads to improved outcome. Um, and so the child needs an urgent EEG uh, with sleep. So the parents have to really be compliant with the sleep instructions and then simultaneous referral to a tertiary center for further evaluation of the child. The most common identified cause of infantile spasms is tuberous sclerosis. So the child has white spots. So the family history has a history of tuberous sclerosis. And so if you've already seen in a newborn who has white spots on their skin, you think they may have TS. Even in the absence of seizures, that child should be referred to a tertiary care center because one of the current protocols for kids, infants with TS, is to screen them with EEGs monthly until a year of age to see if we can catch their infantile spasms earlier than they manifest, but with EEG changes and treat them even sooner and hopefully improve their cognitive and developmental outcome. We talked about childhood abs absence epilepsy, that it's incredibly common. We, we don't always do MRIs, uh, as I've noticed here, if done, uh, because it should be normal. And the children are typically normal 
um, with you know rarely having learning or behavioral differences. Um, differential diagnosis is the child who's stopping and staring, noted by the teacher. They quite the teacher questions, is this, you know, absence epilepsy, but the child could have a behavior problem, could have ADD, anxiety, dyslexia, autism, a whole variety of other sort of things, but the EEG will help you um, get past the absence epilepsy and move on to um, other, you know, diagnoses for this child. And then if the child is very young, so, you know, you have a two and a half year old who's stopping and staring and the family has um, noticed this, you have the EEG done, it's abnormal, it shows absence epilepsy, that child should actually be referred for further genetic testing because there are rare uh, children with a very early onset absence epilepsy who have a rare genetic condition, glucose transporter deficiency, and they're actually treated with a ketogenic diet in addition to medication. So it's a whole different ball of wax um, in, her, in terms of how, how those kids are treated, and you would be suspicious of that in a child who had um, early onset, you know, very early onset absence epilepsy. So same EEG, which is shown here with the three per second um, spike and wave. Uh, you can see these are, the, these are one second markings here. And this is sort of the normal background of an EEG. And then you see simultaneous bilateral um, spike and slow spike and slow discharges that occur. And if there was a video, there should be a video that occurs with the EEG. And then during this time, if the child's awake, they would stop, stare, blink, chew, maybe pick at their clothes, that sort of thing. And if you shout out to them during one of these spells, um, either directions, you know, tell me your name, how old are you? Or if I say fire, you say truck, they won't respond. But as the seizure tails off over, 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, they may actually respond after the seizure ends to what you said to them during the seizure. They typically will miss the first 10 seconds of what you said, but as the seizure is starting to remit over the last five seconds of the seizure, a lot of kids will actually um, afterwards answer what you told them. These kids are treated with esosuximide, uh, you know, pure, pure and simple. Um, it's really the only indication for ethosuximide for the, for the most kids, uh, the most you know common use of it. Occasionally we use it in kids where we're desperate for some drug. Um, and it comes as capsules and liquid. Um, there's a standard dose of 250 milligrams twice a day. And um, this will lead to more than half of kids uh, being seizure free by four months of taking the medication. So it's the kind of thing where you would start, start the dose and uh, for the average size kid and wait it out and see what happens. There are rare side effects like headaches and stomach aches with this medication, um, and you can adjust the dose if needed. It comes as a liquid, which is older than the hills and so does not taste wonderful. Um, it has not had the benefit of the candy industry as some of the more the newer antibiotics, um, but, and most kids will, but most kids will be able to get this down. Um, the goal is to get rid of most of the seizures. So if the family says, you know, we don't see any seizures during the day and we don't see them, the teacher says nothing's happened in the school, but then on Saturday morning during cartoons, I called Joey and he didn't answer. You sort of put that one to the side. We try not to kill the kid with the medications to get rid of every last possible seizure. The EEG will normalize if the child is treated effectively. And so sometimes we'll turn to a repeat EEG just to see where we're getting to. And if the EEG looks pretty good and the seizures are gone, the disc brain discharges are gone, then we will say, look, we think you're doing pretty well. Uh, for kids who don't tolerate Zorontin, there are a whole variety of other medications that uh, can be considered. Uh, but Zorontin is effective, most effective, and has the lowest side effect profile for these kids. So your kid's been taking their Zorontin. You think they're more or less seizure-free. It's been a couple of years. Nothing else has come up. Um, you repeat the EEG. And I usually have them skip the morning dose of the medication the morning they're getting the EEG and then just take it with them to the EEG lab. And when they finish the EEG, go ahead and take their dose. And then when we look at the EEG and get back to them, if it looks fine, and they're essentially still on medications, so... It's not like, you know, we're sure that they're done, but in any case, so we wean off the medications over a couple months, decreasing, you know, taking two doses a day. So for two weeks, you take, you know, one dose a day. And um, if you're taking liquid, you can decrease the volume. But if you're taking pills, you can pretty much go down to one pill a day and then go down to no pills a day. Um, 
And you see whether the spells come back and the parents, of course, are on the out lookout for this stuff and so is the teacher. Sometimes when the epilepsy has remitted, there are focal sharp waves now, not generalized, on the EEG. And so it's important to know that because you might be disturbed to see that you got the EEG, you think the kid's seizure free, and the EEG says there are now focal sharp waves. And that I usually take that as a good sign because that's what shows up in some kids when the epilepsy is gone. And so I usually take that as a good sign that I should be on track to continue winning medication. If your EG shows three per second spike in slow discharges, when you've just missed the morning dose, well, you're, you still have epilepsy. And we usually continue the medications for another one to two years and continue to reevaluate. Some families are really hot to, you know, every summer when school's out, get another EG, see if it's still there. And other families are like, yeah, we're good. I'll just talk to you another two years. Um, and we usually check in with them at least you know, once a year, if not every six months, just to sort of see how things are going, make sure everything else is doing fine. Um, if the child is now up to 12 years of age, you know, pubertal girl, prepubertal boy, still having an abnormal EG, still having seizures symptomatically when the uh, medication has been weaned off, they probably are not going to outgrow their, their epilepsy. Um, a fair number of kids do outgrow their absence epilepsy, but not all. Um, and so this is one of your messages that now you have to start thinking of the future. So if you're a pubertal girl and you still have epilepsy, you're probably still going to have epilepsy. So if you if you essentially become an adult physiologically um, and you still have epilepsy, you're, you're no longer on that grow, outgrowing it kind of pathway. And that's important to remember because as you as girls turn into women and think about childbearing, which hopefully they're not thinking about at 12, but nonetheless, um, it's important to consider getting, then getting switched over to a safe medication that they can take safely for the future and more importantly during pregnancy when, when that does occur, if, if and when. And so that's lamotrigine. There's really one medication that's considered safe for female epilepsy patients and that's lamotrigine. Fortunately, it does treat absence epilepsy for a lot of women. And so is a switch over that would occur. And then you're also talking about driving and medication compliance and all kinds of other exciting stuff um, with teenagers. This is Alaska, uh, and one of my son's surf trips to the Gulf of Alaska. No waves, it turned out, but they had a good time. Moving on to uh, less common uh, but still frequent epilepsy in childhood is uh, partial onset epilepsy. So up to 50% of children with epilepsy will have partial onset epilepsy. Um, and these are kids who can, may have had a febrile seizure in the past that was focal. So uh, with, you know, one side twitching or head and eye deviation. Um, and so those are, are kids that you may have had a little worry about from based on their, their toddlerhood. Um, if they have a central nervous system abnormality, congenital stroke, brain malformation, traumatic brain injury, you know, from child abuse or car accidents or bike accidents or whatever, they're also more likely to have um, partial onset epilepsy. These are kids um, who always get an EEG and an MRI. Um, if they, for some reason, have an MRI done previously and you already know what it shows, then it shows something that could be associated with epilepsy, a congenital abnormality, doesn't, the child doesn't necessarily need another MRI. Um, although very often they'll get one. Um, these kids have a less you know, likely chance of improving and outgrowing their epilepsy as well, only 40%. Um, and often because even if you can't see it, there is something going on in the brain that has provoked these focal and partial onset seizures. Uh, family history may be relevant, although it's not always helpful, but there are some familial uh, partial onset epilepsies. Um, and there are some families that just sort of seem to have more epilepsy than you'd expect. You know, they've got generalized epilepsy, they've got absence abs epilepsy, they have partial onset epilepsy, and they're, they're not necessarily all hereditary, and yet it seems like the family's got an extra burden, I guess, of, of epilepsies. So it is important to ask about that. And so these are kids that you wait for the second seizure and then you treat them. Um, even if the first seizure is status epilepticus, which is defined as uh, more than 20 minutes duration of seizure without improvement in return of consciousness, we still wait for a second seizure. 
Um, the EEG can be normal, uh, very often is, and may or may not correlate with what you find on the MRI. It's nothing more embarrassing, sort of, uh, to have an EEG that shows, you know, left frontal discharges and have an MRI shows the right occipital stroke or whatever. Um, so it's, it doesn't always correlate, but it's always nice when it does. Our first line drug is a levetiracetam, uh, Keppra. And it has a pretty benign side effect profile, doesn't require blood monitoring, has a pretty good dose variability. Um, so you can start with a low dose and work your way up and has really relatively few side effects with the exception of mood behavior, uh, but not appetite, not skin or hair, or gum changes, that sort of thing. So, and it's important to tell the family about the mood and behavior so they can keep an eye on um, what, what's going on. I've had a lot of families who deny that there was a, a problem and then I'm, you know, they and I am getting letters from the teacher saying, you know, Susie is just all over the place, can't focus, can't sit still, what's going on here? Um, and, and that's, of course, because the school setting is a different setting than the home setting where the family is. So it is important to keep an eye on that. The, um, I didn't include this, I guess, but the B6, vitamin B6, pyridoxine can help um, with the mood and behavior in probably about half of kids. And so it's worth considering and you, it can be anywhere from 25 to 100 milligrams twice a day. It's not associated with the long ago reported neuropathy from B6 dosing in women who were taking it for perimenstrual symptoms. Um, and if it works, it's great. And then less commonly, we have kids with um, benign central temporal spike or relentic epilepsy. And these are kids who have sleep associated seizures. So they're asleep and they either wake with a seizure or wake first and then have the seizure. There's prominent facial twitching and drooling. Sometimes they make noises. And these are typically quite short seizures um, and they occur when they're asleep. So even if you're, it's daytime, it's worth asking what was going on. Were you driving someplace? Was the child asleep in the car? That's when the seizure occurred. Ah, so it was daytime, but your child was asleep. And when we give, treat these kids, we treat them really at bedtime only typically. And so they may have a breakthrough seizure if they sleep in the car during the day. Um, and we sort of live with that. And then lastly, we've got the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which I mentioned previously, which is uh, strongly autosomal dominant. Uh, with incomplete penetrance, onset around puberty. And this has a typical EEG with a four to six hertz polyspike and slow wave. E absence epilepsy, three hertz, e JME, four to six. And no nothing drives me crazier than having an EEG report where they don't say what the frequency of the discharges is. And so you may have to actually call your neurologist back and say, okay, could you look at that EEG again and tell me what the number was? What is it three? Is it four to six? What's going on here? And again, as I said earlier, these kids have a low chance of remission, 20% or less. And so they likely will need lifetime medication. And again, for women, for girls, um, you're going to be thinking Keppra or Lamotrigine because nothing else is safe during pregnancy. And then driving and uh, birth control and all that sort of stuff is going to be warranted. Dr. And then can you outgrow your epilepsy? Mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes left. I know yep. you're pretty close. I'm to talking time. fast. Uh, <laughs> um, and it depends on the type. So febrile seizures, absolutely. Petty mal epilepsy, very likely. Myoclonic epilepsy, maybe not. Um, and other types falls in between. Um, and so families are going to be very interested in this answer up front. And you may not be able to give that answer until you have a little more information about what kind of seizure they have. When you're gonna to decide to taper off medication, it's generally two years seizure free, um, and then try to get more information. Has the patient actually been taking the medication? Um, was there any circumstance originally that now is no longer happening um, that was the reason that the patient had the seizure originally? Uh, you may repeat the EEG uh, just to say you did and to look to see if there's any abnormality that you catch this time if you didn't catch one originally. If it was abnormal originally, if it's normal now, that's somewhat reassuring. And if your MRI was lesional, there's an abnormality. Um, did that match, match the EEG and the seizure type? And is that going to need to be repeated for any reason? So it's worth considering that, although not usually required. So we approach kids with possible epilepsy by trying to decide the history and physical, whether they've had a seizure. We get basic labs with the EEG and MRI and try to categorize their seizure type treat them if they've had a second unprovoked seizure, discuss first aid and medical uh, information on your cell phone, encourage compliance, and think about uh, counseling for the child and the family because this is a chronic medical condition and often that doesn't uh, set well. 
there's lots of information at the Epilepsy Foundation of uh, North America, and there's lots of local chapters uh, that you can look up on the internet. Questions? I think we have some. All right. Just a reminder, you can type your questions into either the Q&A box or the chat box, or you can raise your hand and you can speak directly with uh, Dr. Hayward. So first question, under what conditions do you consider epilepsy surgery? So epilepsy surgery is, is, our, is our hope. Um, you know, it's the hope for cure. And so you, you think about epilepsy surgery in a, in a patient who has intractable epilepsy. The definition of intractable epilepsy is a child who has failed two medications given in adequate doses. So that means they actually have to give it, not just, oh, we didn't take it because it looked bad on the internet. Um, appropriate medication. So it has to be the right medication for the patient's seizure type in you know, doses that are been maximized, uh, maximized to dose uh, blood level and or side effects. Um, and they have failed these two medications. And so then you start thinking about um, referral for epilepsy surgery. In practicality, probably one out of a hundred patients who I've referred for epilepsy surgery evaluation would qualify for an actual surgery. Ideally, you would have a lesion in your right temporal lobe, very anterior, um, that was a ca definite cause of your seizures, in which case uh, you would have the least deficit when you lop it out. But epilepsy surgery is not benign, uh, taking little parts of the brain out or even thermo uh, coagulating little parts of the brain is, is unfortunately something that is not always uh, gets you home scot-free. And so it's something we, we hope for because it would be a cure for the epilepsy, uh, but it, it rarely comes to be, it turns out. There are also, if you look at, uh, for instance, temporal lobe epilepsy, which is one of the more common epilepsy types that we hope we can apply uh, surgery to these patients. Um, if you look at their, their seizure free, um, it's not 100%. It's, you know, it's maybe 50% or so in terms of five years off medication seizure free. And, the, and most patients stay on medication for a year after surgery before we attempt to wean them to let things sort of settle down. If the... Uh, if the EEG and the MRI are normal, is it still accurate to refer to their episodes as seizures? Sure. So if you look at people who have uh, partial onset or complex partial seizures, uh, the majority of those patients have normal EEGs interrectally. So, you know, when they're not having a spell and uh, the majority of them have normal MRIs. So that's where the, in, you, you get these tests, but they're not always helpful. And I, in my, my first slides, I had that, the, you know, you get these tests, but they don't always help you. Um, so sometimes we hold out, if someone's having frequent spells, then we would consider, you know, doing uh, prolonged video EEG monitoring. Um, this costs about four to $5,000 a day. So if you've got great healthcare insurance, then sure, go for it. But if you have a 20% copay, you can just rack up the bills pretty rapidly there. Um, for people who are having um, infrequent spells and uh, like a small kid, we might, you know, who's not doing construction or driving a car or something where it'd be dangerous if they had a spell with loss of consciousness, we might actually, um, you know, wait it out and see what happens and try and get more information. We sometimes give a trial of treatment. So we say, you know, you're having these spells or once a month, uh, they sure sound like a seizure, but the EEG is normal, the MRI is normal, you know, you're a normal person otherwise. Um, let's go ahead and, you know, give you a trial of treatment and see what happens. There are plenty of kids who have psychogenic seizures. So spells that are not epileptic, but are psychogenic provoked by, you know, family stress or life stress or what, whatever it is. And they are very uh, difficult to diagnose separately from epileptic seizures because they often look pretty much like it. One of the tricks of the trade that I will trust you not to let out <laughs> is that uh, most people who have epileptic seizures have their eyes open, open, staring, unresponsive. And so the teenager who's flailing on the ground in an arrhythmic fashion and has their eyes squinched closed tight and you can't open them, that is likely not an epileptic seizure. But again, this information is, is not always available right away and you have to sort of tease it out or get someone to do a cell phone video of what's going on um, and uh, get more information. So it's, it's not always you know, the easiest straightforward diagnosis to make, that's for sure. When do we consider a ketogenic diet? 
So the ketogenic diet um, comes in two flavors these days. One is the Atkins type diet, which is a milder ketosis, uh, more liberal ketogenic diet. And then there's the full on, you know, epileptic treatment ketogenic diet. Neither diet is probably all that healthy for the long run. Um, and so, and they have to be maintained very strictly. So we can tutor the ketogenic diet in patients who have failed uh, medications, they would still take medications. They usually are in consultation with an epilepsy center because some of the medications are not consistent with a ketogenic diet. Um, and they are not, the ketogenic diet is not used in lieu of medications. There are a lot of families who say, well, can we just change my child's diet? And then they won't have epilepsy anymore. And I wish it was that simple, but it's not. Um, for the full-on ketogenic diet, the, the, there's a ketogenic nutritionist actually, who calculates what the child must eat and drink every single day. Um, there's a mild dehydration component to the diet as well. So a lot of kids are limited to about 900 milliliters of liquids during the day. Um, they're prone to kidney stones, courtesy of the diet. They're missing all trace nutrients and vitamins that so need to be supplemented. So it's, it's not sort of a benign thing to do and should be done only with uh, recommendations of an epilepsy center and a trained nutritionist to work with the family. Um, when you're ketotic, you have ketone bodies that are running your brain as well as your body. And if you then eat a Snickers bar or any other large source of glucose, you immediately become unketotic except for your brain lags behind your body and you can actually have uh, pretty impressive shifts of osmolarity between the brain and the body and have a risk of brain swelling because of uh, the high ketones in the brain versus now the body, which has no ketones because you ate a Snickers bar. And so when kids are weaned off the ketogenic diet, it usually takes them anywhere from three to six months. So it's, it's not something that is as simple as the lose weight ketogenic diet that we all think we should all should be doing in January after our holiday binges. <laughs> so um, it's unfortunately not that straightforward. Good to know. Um, I don't see any more questions, but we can wait one more minute to see if anything else comes in. Uh, Marie, sure. can you use the chat or the Q&A or raise your hand. But while we wait, thank you, Dr. Hayward. That was sure. really, really great. And there is, I, I didn't put this in this slide set, but there just recently, like within the last two months in the American Academy of Neurology actually had a, uh, a consensus statement on, for adults really more, but nonetheless consensus statement on when to consider weaning medications uh, for people with epilepsy. So that's available as well. I'll get that into this slide set for the next group. Wonderful. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. So thank you again. Um, the session is being recorded and you will receive an email from me with, uh, with the slide deck. So thank you all. All right. Thank you. Bye.